Deckers, who's the CEO of Bayer, and he was giving a talk at a, at a financial Times had a, a seminar about uh, the pharmaceutical sector on de December 3rd. And he was complaining about a compulsory license that was granted on a cancer drug in uh, India that they charge $65,000 a year for in India. And the law in India says that the product has to be available at a reasonable price. And so Bayer has been arguing that $65,000 a year in India, even though it's higher than the price in the UK, is affordable in India. And uh, uh, he was overruled there. He's still litigating this case. But he was asked about it. And he said, people asked me, he said, look, India issued a compulsory license on your cancer drug. Is that going to affect your, you know, your profits in your company, your investors? He said, no, we didn't develop this medicine for Indians. We developed for Western patients who can afford it. So uh, most of us weren't at that conference. I think that. We just sort of saw that this, this week. We were really surprised at that. We were like, thank you, Mark, you know, Mr. Deckers, for that great quote. <laughs> okay. All right, now I'm going to get back into the talk of the linkage here. Uh, but the first slide, sort of, I think, in a way, sort of is part of the motivation. Why do we care about the linkage? Why do you care about um, things? It's because, uh, I'll talk more about it later, but you know, as you've already had a lot of presentations, the sort of Katie's presentation, the David's presentation, go through a lot of the problems you have with high prices. But what is deal linkage? Deal linkage, I think, first is is it's defined by its opposite. Um, the opposite being the linkage between prices and R and D. So I, I understand you had a guy this morning that was all about you know you get, get a lot of money to companies and things like that. And high prices are not really a huge problem because. Uh, it costs a lot of money to develop R&D. And that's the sort of idea we're sort of used to. We're used to the idea that, okay, if a drug costs $100,000, $20,000, $1,000 a pill or whatever, it seems kind of harsh, but you just have to kind of connect that in your mind with the idea that that's how you get R&D, right? That's kind of, that's how we're socialized, that's how we think about it. No one's really, you know, you, you sort of just assume that, that that's, that's kind of a state of nature. So right now we use patents, and not just patents. We use things like test data exclusivity, orphan drug exclusivity, and similar types of intellectual property regimes for cases where the companies can't get patents. They're all they're justified as incentives to induce private investment in R&D, and it's the grant to these time-limited monopolies and the high prices of monopoly profits. That's the reward for successful investment. So if you're good at what you do, uh, you know, in addition to the esteem of your peers and uh, the applause from your neighbors, the theory is that you know you get money out of it. You get money, not just money, but you get really uh, you, the way how do you get your money? Because they grant you a monopoly on the product, and you can charge really whatever you want for it. So the campaign for delinkage is a political demand that governments abandon the use of monopolies as the incentive for investment in R&D. And, and, and I think it's probably best to sort of say that up front, because if you sort of think of delinkage as something about the language, or it's, it's some technical thing, or something like that, you know, it's kind of a, it's a branding for really a, a larger political campaign we have to change the world and change the way we think about financing R&D. And why do we use delinkage these days? It's because we used a lot of other words for it, some of which were like whole paragraphs. And you know, we had, you know, a lot of people didn't really understand what we were talking about. Or they, they didn't get it, or it just, just took us too long to explain it, or whatever. But for whatever reason, uh, when we use the word delinkage, we'd say delinking, you know, R and D costs the price of drugs. We found that if you're talking to your mother, or your father, or a cab driver, or you know, your teacher, or whatever, that somehow that was a, an idea that was like simple and basic enough, but profound at the same time, that it sort of seemed to work in a way that, that some of these more other you know, lengthy conversations we had. That's, that's, that's my story, I'm sticking to it. Now, what are the motivations for delinkage? 
Uh, okay, let's start again with the negative. Uh, monopolies on new medicine, diagnostics, and other medical technologies result in, and I'm not going to waste a lot of time proving this stuff because it's not the best use of my time, and it's not, it's gonna, you've already heard it several times today. But like, high prices, that's, there are a lot of consequences from high prices. It's, it's a, it, it can create a, uh, a harsh burden on people that can't afford, uh, that, 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 that do buy their products. And a lot of times it just leaves people out that don't buy the product itself. I, I'll just give one short story from my own experience. I'm in the United States, I have pretty good health insurance. My wife uh, is a stage four cancer patient. Uh, she used to be a stage three cancer patient. That's not good, there's no stage five. She's a breast cancer patient. She's taken a drug that didn't exist before, uh, before, uh, you know, 15 years ago. Uh, her septum, her last injection was $9,000. She has to be injected every three weeks. Now, uh, she's been, uh, she did it, she took it for a year and then they stopped giving it to her. And then six months later, she was re-diagnosed and that's when she went from stage three to stage four. Right now, the insurance is paying for the product. Um, we had a conversation last week because we, we, it's possible that at some point the insurance will stop paying for it because they've been paying for it beyond kind of a label for it because it's, uh, she's in a, a category of users, metastasized users, where, where uh, it's not guaranteed that the, the company's going to continually pay for it forever because it's so expensive. So the company might say, we'll stop and see what happens like it did the first time. Uh, so we had a conversation in our house, what would we do if that happens, because we, you know, we wanted to keep taking it. I said, well, we could, in nine months she could qualify for some government program if she quit her job and went through a lot of paperwork at about nine months in the U.S. I believe that she could get on this, uh, this uh, Medicare for a treatment and the government would pay for it. But in that nine months I said, well, maybe we could, you know, cash in some of our pension funds or take out a mortgage in our house or something like that to pay for the cost of the drug between now and, uh, you know, and that nine months would kick in. And then she said to me, no, that she didn't want that to happen. She would just go without the drug, which would be probably a death sentence. So that's my household. That's last week in my household. So when people say high prices are not really an issue for people, um, uh, yeah, that doesn't seem true to me where I live, but it's far worse in developing countries because almost no women that have a, have a condition she has, she's her two positive breast cancer patient, that's about one out of five breast cancer patients are her two positive. It's a very effective drug. There's almost no access to this drug for the past 15 years or since it's developed in developing countries. They didn't even test for it, which is also expensive because of the patents on the test. They don't even test for it in developing countries because if they did find that you needed the drug, nobody could afford to buy it. So there's a campaign to bring this drug out there. It's a cancer drug. So if you think it's okay for 80% of the world's population to price down the market for this very effective cancer drug, this game-changing cancer drug, if, that, if, that, if you think that's okay, then maybe you're not as sympathetic to this argument as I am. But I think if you have drugs, and they work, and not all drugs do, but if you do have drugs that actually work, and they actually change outcomes and things like that, I feel very uncomfortable personally with the idea that you have limited access, because they're cheap to make copies of these drugs. Perceptin is being sold for six to $9,000 a gram by Roche. Roche makes $500 million a month, a month on this drug. This is a drug that cancer charities put on events to sort of pay for the early research out of, out of, out of California by an academic uh, doctor. And it's just, a, it's just a huge bonanza for them. Secondly, there's a lot of wasteful outlays on marketing and development mentally on important drugs. If suppose you took 1% uh, of that, what would 1% of $500 million be? That would be, uh, what, $5 million, right? Per month, right? So let's just say it was just 1%. And suppose there was some researcher there that, or maybe there was like 20 different researchers that did things that kind of led to the insights upon which Roche was able to get this, you know, this product on the market. Then they would be getting, you know, the one percent of the revenue for the product as part of their open source dividend. It could be two percent, could be three. Depends how much you want to induce people to share. At a certain percentage, 
it completely blows away the patent system because if you're a researcher, the last thing you want to do is patent up your technology because then you're not eligible for the open source dividend. The open source dividend is only available to people that openly share and don't patent and don't charge royalties. So people are like telling the technology transfer office at the university to go to hell because they want to go the open source dividend route because it's going to pay more than they can get from licensing. What's more, it has a different advantage. If you're going to license your technology, you actually have to go and pick the best firm to license your technology to. And how do you know what the best firm is, right? But open source dividend, you effectively are licensed to all firms. Everyone can take a crack at it. If anyone can figure it out, you're in the money, right? Without a license, without a contract, with no transition cost, without giving all your money to lawyers. You just have to basically document what you did and identify it as shareable, and then bang. You, you, might, you, might, you might end up buying two houses, right, instead of one house. <laughs> so I think this is an important idea, because it, what it does is it, it uses economics to reconcile the higher value that research has for being open than it does for being secret and closed. Um, uh, and get that uh, going in the right direction. Where do these things stand? Well, there's a lot of efforts to move these things along. I'm, people are really frustrated. They say to me, Jamie, you've been talking about this for years. It's a complete failure that you haven't done it yet. Everything's a mess. It's the old school. It's like, let's talk about, you know, like uh, better regulation of prices and drugs or all those you know, like reformist things that, you know, we all work on. Well, I will tell you, I work on all those old school things myself a lot of the time. I just get tired of working on them because I feel like that's too much work. It's just too much work to mop up all the corruption and bad outcomes you have from the grant of the monopoly. So I want some of my time to be able to, like, the day when we don't have the monopolies, where we fix things. So here's some ideas. Like, one, there's a WHO, was, Advertising for demonstration projects on delinkage. All of the ones that challenged the financing mechanism were rejected last December in a group of experts that almost none of us knew who they were, unfortunately. But if there's a silver lining, it would be that in order to get the proposals to the committee to look at, several really interesting proposals were, proposed, were put together by different groups dealing with uh, concrete problems like better fever diagnostics, better cancer diagnostics, uh, drug development in the TB area, and antibiotics innovation, where you had the, the more really innovative, the combination of both the push and the pull of the prizes as well as the grants with the full open source development model and, and multi-country thing. And now the challenge will be for the people who develop these proposals to push these things through the more mainstream components of the international community. The cancer prize fund idea is that you pick off just cancer drugs for Europe or developing countries and you model it as follows, that you have a fraction of the cancer treatment budget in that country to pay off innovators, but the drugs become like priced like aspirin. You go full generic all the time on cancer drugs, no more $100,000 cancer drugs, the drug that my wife takes that cost, it was, uh, it was priced at $1,000 a week in India would be priced at like $5 a week. You know, you'd you really bring prices down. But it didn't mean that the drug developer would be out of the money because they, they, they participate in a prize fund based upon, you know, the, the, the improvements in cancer drugs did to, to outcomes and things like that. Thailand had proposed this to be done by the developing countries and some Latin American countries have explored this. And the problem in Europe is the difference of income between Southern Europe and Eastern Europe and Northern Europe is huge. Where I'm from, the United States, there's like maybe a two to one difference between, say, Mississippi and Connecticut in per capita incomes. It's more like 10 to one between some countries in Europe and other countries in Europe. You cannot have a single price for cancer that makes any sense in Europe right now if you aspire to have real universal access. And when they try and put cheaper drugs on the market and in, in, in Greece, they, they end up being smuggled out of Greece and sold in other countries to have stockouts. You need to have the NSA help you police 
you know, like a million different prices if you want to try and really make it available to everyone because you have a million different incomes and situations. And now you have people trying to have different prices for the same drug for different uses. Is it used to treat your eye? Is it used to treat something else? And there would be like huge difference in prices depending on how the same drug is used. So that's, this is better. And to get this done, you need to have the government's new cost-benefit analysis of the benefits and costs of switching from one regime to the other. Because if I do the cost-benefit analysis one more time, or if you do it, it's helpful. But when the governments do the number, for whatever reason, if it's a government number, it attains an entirely different level of respectability. So the strategy for a group like this is to get your government to just do a goddamn study and ask the question, if you made the switch, well, how would it change outcomes? And how would it change the economics of the thing? When we ask uh, Calypso from, from, from NICE about this, at one meeting on this issue, we asked her, how, what would happen in the UK if you switched to the delinkage model? And she said, she said, it would improve outcomes and lower our costs. I don't think there's any question about that. What you need is to associate some numbers to them. In how much would it improve outcomes, and how much would it improve co a lower cost? The U.S. Senate recently voted to ask the National Academies, which wants a million dollars from the study, to look at this in the context of HIV, antibiotics, and all drugs. <coughs> and we think if we get that study on the National Academies, that would be helpful, but I hope you guys can beat us to it and have to get a good study out of the U.K. government. I think. My last slide, substantive slide. Uh, push versus pull. Push and pull, that's kind of like economist lingo, but it's more like, uh, I think push is what people used to describe things like uh, grants and contracts or some kind of direct funding thing. And pull would be things like the incentives that you normally associate with patents, but we're trying to replace with innovation prizes. I think that you need some combination, probably of both. A lot of people who work in innovation think that a single instrument is probably not as good as uh, multiple instruments, because some of these instruments are really good at some things, but not as good at other things. And so I think you have to look at like an ecosystem for innovation. And what you want to do is figure out what is the right balance between these different instruments. Don't sort of become too ideological about it's got to be all one or the other, because I think a system that has a combination of things is probably better. And then another thing that Tim and I, and others are quite keen on is the idea you can introduce competition at different levels. You don't have to have a centralized state planner kind of model for everything. And we've done a fair amount of work in different how this can kind of play out. And I'm going to finish right now. If I have any time left to take questions, I hope I didn't uh, talk too long. <coughs> we, I just, we just created a new list for the dealing each campaign. This will be a public list. And you can get to it from our web page. And IP Health is like a, how many people here subscribe to IP Health? Well, IP Health is a, a good, good way to monitor the day-to-day -day things that are going on on, on, on on patents, on pricing issues, and things like that around the world. And this, is, this, is, this has no subscribers. This is a new list so far. And that's how you can reach me. And uh, that's my experience. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> These, uh, these price funds you mentioned are all per, uh, very exciting and very, very realistic, uh, it feels, uh, certainly given the work you've done with the CWG and uh, the WHO. But what, what's the response been in what, what we can describe as sort of mainstream of Big Pharma? Well, I think that uh, the first response we had was uh, from the companies. I'll just focus on the companies first, because uh, the companies' reactions are kind of interesting in a way, because uh, they're, they're a little different than. A lot of, of non-company people go, well, I, I don't want to hear anything about it because I don't think you can actually change the business model. So don't bother me with any facts or arguments. It's just, it's just you can't do it because nobody could do, could do anything. Like, like, like the internet could never have changed telecommunications pricing models with a new business model that was better. Like that never happened. Or, you know, like, you know, there's been a lot of business model changes in the world, but some people are in complete denial that we can change this business model. 
because they think big companies are just all powerful, even though it's not true across the board in, the, in, in other sectors. So, um, uh, but the companies are, they know that they're vulnerable, so they actually do engage a bit more. So their first reaction was a split within the companies, because Nervatus and uh, Gilead and Johnson & Johnson, in particular, those three companies came out and said that prizes and pooling of intellectual property was sort of open licensing combined with prizes, they thought was the right way to think about type 2 and type 3 diseases, meaning things like tuberculosis, AIDS, and, uh, and uh, neglected diseases. Because they said the current system just really can't work for those diseases and things like that. And so they said, yes, you should experiment with that. Other companies were like, GSK took a different attitude. GSK said, we don't want to give up the monopoly. And, and uh, uh, Aventus said the same thing. Because Aventus said, we're, we're fundamentally a marketing company. We acquire our innovation from third parties. And we don't want to sort of promote the idea that you can have, we're relegated to the innovation side of the business because that's, that's actually not even where we're getting close to our money. So there was kind of a, a split. Uh, but Gilead had a very small international sales force. They don't have you know, a lot of employees, but they had a strong pipeline. They like this. Johnson & Johnson, and I mentioned in Nirvana, but just for type 2, type 3 diseases. Now what you have is that the uh, antibiotics issue has become a lot more attention. And so now you have the president of the European Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association, Bertram. He's come out on several occasions and said that the grant of monopolies is the wrong way to think about antibiotics innovation and that they should use prizes as the economic reward, because then you can really regulate the marketing practices. Because he said the prizes are like, he said the grant of monopoly runs in the wrong direction as far as the regulatory objectives for uh, antibiotics. And so now we've got kind of a better dialogue on antibiotics. And there's still conversation, and Unitate right now wants to basically explore this issue of how they deal with the linkages that relates to AIDS drugs to expand into middle countries where there's access there. So I think in HIV, because there's this crisis of the second line drugs that Katie talked about and this collapse of the funding for the global fund and this abandonment of the middle, the middle income countries, it's, you know, it's kind of going bad that way. I think there's a lot of interest in that. In the US, uh, in some countries, it's the financial crisis that's forcing people to do things. When I was in Greece at Athens, I think a uh, meeting that David uh, organized, David Harrison organized, one of the members of the Greek party was like, uh, when, he, when, he, when he talked about the cancer prize fund proposal, they were like really interested because it was something new and it seemed to make sense for a southern European country a lot. Maybe, maybe the northern European countries don't mind being thrown in with Eastern Europe and lower, you know, southern Europe because that actually brings their prices down, actually. Uh, but, I mean, it, it depends where you are in Europe, it depends how you do it. I tell people that ultimately what will move things are self-interest by people. U.S. right now wants to have universal treatment for HIV. We're only, we have 1.2 million HIV positive people. We have 50,000 new infections per year. We used to have 200,000 people because they died. Now they don't die. So now it's growing every year. Well, the new, the new, new, new AIDS drugs are $25,000 a year. We're only treating about 40% of the US HIV positive people. That's why we have 50,000 new infections per year, by the way. So if you were treating more people, you'd have fewer new infections. You could eventually eliminate AIDS if you treated enough people, because infection rates go way down when you treat people. But can, they, can, they, can the US go from 40% to 80% on $25,000 a year? No. They can't really. They even have, right now, it's a huge problem. They get it harder to get under government support programs and things like that. Jails don't test people in the US, some of them, to see if they're HIV positive because they don't want to pay for the drugs. So, uh, HIV is a possible area for the United States because the US can save more than $5 billion a year by making the switch and go to universal coverage and expand and double, and double the amount of coverage without, without breaking the sweat. And they can buy FDA-approved drugs for all the drugs they need, because you can buy them now for less than 1% on average of the U.S. price, uh, of the, of the uh, U.S. Re uh, average wholesale price, uh, from FDA-approved suppliers. Uh, supplying the U.S. government outside of the U.S. to run foreign uh, AIDS programs. So I think 
if we can get the National Academy, if we can get this thing scored in the budget, you get into a budget crunch thing, and everyone's trying to figure out how many school guards to lay off and things like that, we can say, well, by the way, just on AIDS programs alone, we can come up with $5 billion a year or $50 billion over 10 years. Does anybody want $50 billion in the budget process? I know how to get it, right? That puts us in a position at least to kind of enter the conversation like that. And that's, I think, the way to do it, is to sort of talk to people about their budget issues, how they're going to pay for things, and ask them if it would work out better for them. And I say, I'm sure you love the drug companies, but how much do you love them? It's an expensive romance, you know? <laughs>